But first, in the years since the end of the First World War, many great writers have added to the canon of modern war journalism. Contemporaneous, of course, and historical contributions from many of the world's great writers, expanding our understanding of the horrors of war and the sacrifice made by hundreds of thousands of brave men and women. However, apart from these brave war correspondents themselves reporting back to the home front, I think none were better at documenting this incredible history than the late Australian journalist and author Les Carline, renowned for his detailed research and brilliant storytelling. Gallipoli, published first in 2001, is considered one of the most definitive works on the subject. And then with The Great War, this is his second book, Les provides one of the greatest accounts of Australians during World War I, bringing it all to light with his wonderful prose, telling us the story of the Western Front and not just the generals and commanders of that war, but also the stories of everyday heroes and bravery. If you haven't read them or you haven't got a copy at home on the shelf, I encourage you to get out and get them. Now, sadly, Les Carline died back in 2019, but I'm glad to say his legacy lives on. Tonight, joining me is Les's son and award-winning journalist himself, Patrick Carline. Patrick, um, I've got to say, lots of privileges you get when you work for a Prime Minister, but, but one of the things that's always stuck with me is before Tony Abbott went to the centenary of, of Gallipoli, the landings, and, and was to give a big speech on behalf of the nation, he pulled together who he regarded the, the best military historians of the day and writers. And so they had a dinner at Parliament House in his private office. Your father was there. And I was just uh, sitting at the table down the end writing some notes. And the discussion that went around that room of what should be in this speech on behalf of all Australians that will stand the test of time, your father's contribution at that moment brought tears to the eyes of everyone in the room. It was extraordinary. What drove his, his deep and abiding interest in military stories? Uh, well, Peter, I think I think Dad grew up with the uh, Anzac mythology, as everybody of, as of that generation did, and I think at some point Dad sort of worked out that that was selling the Anzac short. That uh, when he dived into the diaries and the letters of the men who were at the front, he discovered that most of them were scared, uh, most of them were very ordinary citizen soldiers. They weren't they weren't there to sort of further their careers, and they found themselves in exceptionally hard circumstances. And I think what struck him um, and what drove him to write about it was the fact that these ordinary blokes were doing extraordinary things uh, when at the same time they missed their home, they feared death, they, they were doing things that were unimaginable. And they did so for over the course of World War I for three or four years. I mentioned at the top of the show, um, I had a, a great-grandfather who, who signed up early. Uh, his father agreed, uh, and only, in, and this is the handwritten notes of the War Memorial, only agreed because he'd already had five brothers over on the Western Front. So imagine being the mum and dad and having six of your boys overseas, but uh, everyone thought at that stage, particularly the young, it might have been a big adventure. What was it like, what was the process like for your dad to bring these stories to life? Well, Dad was a perfectionist, as you've probably gathered in meeting him over the years, um, uh, and he was a great storyteller. And I think what, uh, for him, uh, I think he spent about three years writing Gallipoli, and that was every day, and he obsessed over it. Um, uh, he had a photographic memory, but he also dreamt about being on those battlefields as he was writing the books. Uh, he had such a vivid mm. sort of recall and a great sort of understanding of how it smelt. Uh, and the little details that mattered. Uh, and that was one of his great gifts, was in reading the, the diaries and the letters, many of which I've read myself over the years. Uh, he'd pick up a tiny detail that might have been an aside or whatever and sort of uh, use his imagination to actually tease that out and make it resonate in a way that is, that is terribly unusual. Two things that strike you when you go to both Gallipoli and, and, and maybe to France and Belgium as well is... In Gallipoli, they were young, and you look up at the, those cliffs and you think they never stood a chance. And in France and Belgium, what struck me again, the age on the graves, but, but, but how, how closely they fought against the enemy. I mean, it was really hand-to-hand -hand combat. It was at close quarters. It's not modern warfare where you're at great distance or, or you're killed by basically a machine. I mean, these were um, men against men, weren't they? Uh, absolutely, certainly in Gallipoli. I mean, the, the, 
the story of Gallipoli is about hanging on. It's not. There's no triumph to it. There's no. There's no militaristic overtone to it. It was these poor blokes who landed in the wrong place and were looking up at the enemy for the next eight months. And the fact that so many of them survived and that they clung on uh, in such miserable circumstances really, really is you know a, just a great story to be told. Uh, and I, that's true what you say of France and Gallipoli as well, where you'd have these pitch battles where grenades would be thrown from trench to trench and they'd be two, three metres apart. Uh, they'd be so close together that they'd have time to pick up the grenades and throw them back before they exploded. Um, and I think, you know, in France, the, the, you had the mud as, as well and you had this attritional, never-ending sort of quality to it. Um, where mm. the, a battle would be launched and one side would take 50 metres that way or 50 metres that way and, and the war would go on for years. Uh, there was a sort of demoralising futility to it, if you like, both in France and Gallipoli, which does go to the Anzac spirit, I think, certainly. It's funny, you know, Gallipoli was our great defeat. I think most Australians know the story. You grow up learning it at school. But it it wasn't until I read his book on the Great War, which was the European conflict, that, that I understood it was such a big um, a victory, you know. You, you know we won the war, of course, but you don't understand the Australian um, impact, how many Australians really turned the tide in a lot of those French towns and, of course, to John Monash. And I think it was your dad who really opened all of that up for me. I think that, that was the extraordinary book for me. Look, the Western Front was such a broad canvas, and as I was saying, I mean, one battle here, one, didn't count much for much a kilometre up the road or five miles up the road where a battle was lost there. And it really was this sort of uh, uh, line that sort of kept moving very weakly from side to side. Um, yeah. And there was, a, uh, there was a futility to it. I mean, we talk about the Western Front as a victory. It certainly wasn't for the Australian blokes who were there and sort of, you know, going from this battle, you know, whether it was Poziers or Fromel or wherever, to another battle soon afterwards, which really didn't make a lot of difference. And I think, I think that's part of the Anzac story too, is that they hung on. They were in the mud, they were dying, they were getting sick. Uh, and they did make a difference. Certainly, you referred to John Monash. Uh, his strategy in 1918 mm. really did tip things in the Allies' way. I know your dear dad's not with us anymore, but uh, what a wonderful legacy he leaves behind. Patrick, thanks for joining us.